David, and today is the today is the third session we start with, and so today our focus will be on Samuel anointing David. So the title that I gave for, as I was reflecting last evening, the title that I have given already on the group, I have put the anointing of David by Samuel. And so we will, what we will reflect on is how man appoints, God anoints. That is where the focus will be. Man appoints, that is King Saul, that he was appointed by the people of Israel because they wanted king. And here we find God, he comes, he comes personally and he anoints the one he has chosen, that is King David. The passage, the chapter that we are going to reflect on is 1 Samuel chapter 16. And the story goes something like this, where God has rejected King Saul. And we know, if you want to know what is the reason, we have to read chapter 14 and chapter 15. How Saul will continuously disobey the commands of God and how God had to keep him aside. And God tells Samuel that now, he has chosen a king after his very own heart. That's what we reflected last time. David, a man after God's own heart. And now Samuel is commanded to go to the place where David stays and in, uh, to the house of Jesse. He is not told, Samuel is not specifically told that he is going to anoint David. Samuel is told that he has to go to the house of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. And there God will reveal to him the one he needs to anoint. Samuel is afraid that King Saul, if he comes to know, it may cost his life. And so God instructs Samuel that you tell him that you are going there to offer a sacrifice. And for that sacrifice, you know, after the sacrifice was done, the sacrifice animal was eaten by a group of people whom who were invited. And so God tells Samuel that you can go there to offer a sacrifice. And after you offer a sacrifice, you can invite Jesse and his sons to come there. And that is where God will reveal to him who is the one he is anointed. Today we are going to reflect on three aspects of God's anointing. You know, oftentimes we also sometimes uh, uh, look at that we want to be anointed by the Lord. Uh, today specifically we are going to look at today's session and perhaps the next session where we find David is playing music to God. You know, sorry, music. Saul is tormented by the evil spirit and how David playing the music delivers Saul through the gift of music David is able to deliver Saul from the tormenting spirit. Today we want, today and the next session, we are going to learn something about the anointing aspect. You know, it's not only the anointing that happens when someone lays hands and anoints us, but how anointing is a lifestyle, is a lifestyle that is being that is lived out. And that is what we are going to focus on. The secret how the anointing remains, how the anointing not only remains, but the anointing keeps growing. Now, if you look at, you know, the on the anointing of David, if uh, we focus on this whole aspect of how Samuel comes and anoints David, there are three specific times when David receives the anointing from the Lord. There are three specific times mentioned in the scriptures where David, we find King David is anointed by the Lord. One is right here where Samuel anoints him. This is the first anointing that happens. Then in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 2 Samuel, the second book of Samuel chapter 2 was uh, Five onwards, verse 3, 4, and 5, we find David again is anointed as the king of uh, king of Judah. And then the third anointing happens is David is anointed as the king of Israel. Now, if you reflect on these three anointings, every anointing is expanding, is expanding, you know, it, or I can say increasing David's 
sphere of influence. Okay, that is what is happening. See, first is a personal anointing. Then the anointing happens where Sam, uh, David is anointed as the ruler of Judah. Judah is particular like it's like a state. And then the third anointing happens is David is anointed as the king of Israel. So from that we come to know that David is growing in his anointing. He not only receives the anointing from Samuel, but he keeps growing in that anointing. And as he keeps growing over that anointing, his sphere of influence is growing. From personal anointing of Samuel, now we find he is anointed as the king of Judah or a particular state and then over a particular country, Israel. So his, his sphere of influence is just increasing. And that is what can happen. The anointing increase. You know, all, all of us, sometimes we receive the charism of the Holy Spirit through our baptism, through our sacrament of confirmation. But it's, a, it's all a different story. How many of us grow in that? And grow in that and the, the sphere of influence keeps increasing. Today and the next session, we're going to look at the secret, how this increase happens. Okay, how this increase happens. So, uh, Celia, you'll have to put your mobile uh, mic off. Celia, you have to put your mic off. There is a slight disturbance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, we have to see how this sphere of influence happens. How this anointing grows. That is what we are going to focus on. Very important part. Uh, so, let's look at, today we are going to reflect on 1 Samuel chapter 16. And our focus will be today, the anointing of David by Samuel. In fact, Samuel is not the one who is anointing David. Samuel is instructed by God that he should go and he should anoint David. So today we are going to look at the three. When God anoints someone, the three aspects of the anointing. Three aspects of the anointing. That's what we are going to focus on. Uh, more time is going to go on the second and the third. Because that is where we start learning how the anointing gets deeper. Okay, so three aspects of the anointing of God. Uh, I'm going to use the letter R and we're going to look at three R's that talk about the three aspects of the anointing of God. Number one, the first thing, the responsibility, the first, that's the first R, the responsibility for anointing is God's alone. What do I mean? The responsibility for anointing is God's alone. It simply means it is God who is taking the initiative to anoint David. God who takes the initiative to anoint David. That's the anointing difference in the anointing between uh, David and Saul. If you read 1 Samuel chapter 8, Verse 5, you find the people of Israel are asking God for a king. They are saying the other nations around are having a king. And so we also want a king. God himself, then God talks to Samuel and he says, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me because I was going to be their king. And then Saul, Samuel is led to Saul and Samuel elects Saul as a king. Saul was elected as a king at the request of people, but not so with David. David, <coughs> in fact, is the initiative is taken by the Lord himself in David's life. And we have to look at why uh, the initiative was taken. Because David is described as a man after God's own heart. Now that's what happens in our day-to-day -day life. In our day-to-day -day life, David became a man, a man after God's own heart, not when he was doing ministry. In fact, he was just taking care of his father's sheep. And it was in his daily routines, daily work, daily family life. You see, this is something very important for us to hear. That he cultivated the heart, which was after God's very own heart. It was not cultivated when he was serving, you know, it's as if, you know, he's doing 
service for the Lord. He's doing ministry for the Lord. Because often there is a misunderstanding we have that only if we do ministry, we are cultivating a heart after God's own heart. Up till now, David is not doing any ministry. All the things that he's doing is just his family responsibilities. He's just fulfilling. And that word, you know, this family responsibility is going to be a sentence that we're going to hear again and again and again. So he's living out his family responsibility. Now, why that is important? It is simply important because that is our primary vocation. You see, ministry is different from vocation. Ministry is what we will do. But vocation takes place over ministry. Vocation is what kind of a life God has called me to live. What kind of a life God has called me to live. And so the church tells us about three types of vocation. Number one, the vocation to the religious life. Second, the vocation to the married life. And third, the singleness, being single is also a vocation. And so what David is doing here is he's not doing any ministry up till now. He is just living out his vocation. Now that's where many of us sometimes when we are touched by the Lord and all, I know we, we like to serve the Lord, we like to do things for God, but our experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and if we have gone for a retreat and we have been touched by the Lord and we have experienced the Lord in our life, that experience, first of all, should lead us to live out our vocation well. Family life. Because if you look at David's life, right now, he's already, you know, even before Samuel can anoint him as king, God already describes him a man after his own heart. Even before God could call him to ministry, David is described as a man who has become a man after God's very own heart. And so how did he live that out? He lived that out by living out his vocation. That's what we find. David lived that out by living out his vocation. So that's where the uh, selection happens. So Saul's selection was initiated by man. God, God, people wanted him as king and God gave them. But David's selection comes from the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 1 to 3 tells us that God takes the initiative. Okay? God tells Samuel, you go to the, you know, you go to this particular place where Jesse is living and there I will show you who you should anoint. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the initiative is taken by God. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when David is elected, when David is elected, the initiative is taken, is taken by, by, by people. So you find the responsibility for the anointing is God's alone. It is God alone who takes the initiative to anoint David. And that's the first thing we need to learn. The responsibility for the anointing is God's alone. And how God takes that responsibility? Number one, you know, what makes God to take that responsibility of anointing us? Remember, as I said, vocation comes first. Ministry comes second. Recently, I had a friend of mine who had gone to become a deacon. <coughs> we, we have that in Mumbai where we have deacons also who, are, who have to go through training of a few years study in theology and various other aspects that they become a deacon. Uh, married people, your people, most of the deacons are deacons who are married. And so sometimes after their retirement and all, they like to, you know, serve the church. Very good idea, very good initiative that they like to serve the church. But we, uh, what happened was something couldn't go proper. Something was not going proper and he, uh, some problems came. And 
he couldn't complete his studies. He was very disappointed. And so one day when I was talking to him, of course, I let him, uh, I just told him, because he was very disturbed about that, that he had to leave his studies right in between because of a particular illness. And so since he was very disturbed about it, I directed him to one of a, uh, you know, I felt another good priest needs to guide him. He needs a proper guidance. And he went to this priest and after that, his mind was at peace. So the next time when I met him, I was having a chat. What did father tell you? So I was aware of what father will tell him, but I wanted that to come out from mouth of a priest. So he says, uh, I was told, you know, my primary vocation in life since I'm married is family life. Becoming a deacon is addition to that. Okay, Becoming a deacon is addition to that. So if it does not work, it does not work. I need to focus on, because he said I was so getting focused on becoming a deacon. That was secondary. Because why? My primary vocation is I'm called to live the family life. Now that's what brothers and sisters I want you to become aware of. Sometimes we can get so caught up in doing ministry that we are neglecting our vocation and that's pretty dangerous. It's pretty risky for our soul. I'll show you why it's risky for our soul. If you look at the Vatican documents and the teaching of the Vatican uh, two documents, it tells us, number one, our main call in life is to become holy. Holiness is a call for everyone. Now, the question is, uh, how does holiness happen in our life? And so the Vatican document itself answers, well, holiness, uh, holiness actually happens in our life when we live out our vocation in life. When we live out our vocation in life. Now, all of us who are married here, remember, ministry is secondary. Please keep this in mind. Vocation. Our vocation, our family life is primary. David's life up till now, when he's anointed, when God takes the step of anointing him, he has already become a man after God's own heart. How? He's living out his vocation in the family life. Taking care of his father's sheep. Helping his family in the family business, in the family work. In fact, he's be, that work was done, as we saw it in the first session, was done by the servant of the house. And so David is like, as already before he can become the servant of, you know, God appoints him to become the servant of, you know, the servant king of Israel. He's already become the servant of his family. I hope so we are getting this easily because this is one theme of David's life that we will see occurring again and again. How David was living out his vocation of his family life. So the responsibility for the anointing is God's. Okay. So what enables God to take uh, the anointing? What enables God to take the anointing? It is nothing else but David living out his vocation. The second point. The second R. The requirement for anointing was God's. What do I mean by the requirement? God knew that if I'm going to anoint someone, there are certain requirements the person has to fulfill. There are certain requirements the person has to have. And then only I will anoint him. So let's have a look at what were the three requirements what were the three things God uh, required, God wanted to anoint someone? This will help us to know what are the requirements I must have in my own life so that I too receive the anointing from the Lord. So if you look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6, Samuel, when he goes there, so, you know, he starts uh, the whole process of discernment he looks at Eliab, Jesse's eldest son. And Eliab is very handsome. He's already a soldier in the army. And David says immediately, oh, this it looks like this is the Lord's anointed. 
and so in verse seven, God tells him, "Do not go on his physical appearance. Do not go on his physical appearance. How he looks, how talented he is, for I have rejected him. Look at that word. God says, you know, I have rejected him. He, he, he's not the one I am selecting. That's what God tells uh, Samuel about Adiab, David's elder brother. Then the, comes the famous verse." God, a man looks at the heart, but uh, sorry, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so the first requirement, you know, the requirement, remember, we are focusing right now on the requirement for God's anointing. The first requirement is God, it is not physical appearance and talents, but spiritual attitude, spiritual attitude that God looks for. You know, what is your spirituality? It's not that, you know, how well you look, how wonderful you are talented, but it's the spiritual attitude, it's the heart God looks at. That's what God will look at. Samuel was get, got carried away by the physical appearance, by the talent, but God looked at the spiritual attitude, at the heart, and that's the first requirement. Spiritual attitude. In 2 Chronicles, second book of Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 9. That's my one of my favorite verse. In fact, this verse is, you know, every time a verse like this comes, and I'll tell you why this is, the, uh, there are two, three verses which are similar to, these are my favorite verses. But one is second Chronicles, chapter 16, verse 9, uh, where it says, the eyes of the Lord look to and fro. Okay, which means the verse says, God is searching, God is looking out for a man whose heart is completely his. Look at what kind of a man God is looking for. God is looking for a man whose heart is completely his. So that's the first kind of a, a, a requirement that God has. He goes by the heart of a person, not the physical appearance. And so that's the first requirement. It's not outward appearance, not talent, not physical appearance, but it's the spiritual attitude. The second requirement for God's anointing is we have that in Psalm 89, verse 18 to 20, where God is talking about what all he has done. For Israel. And then he goes on to say, you know, I have chosen, he goes on to say, I have chosen David, my servant. Look at that word servant. Very important. I have chosen David, my servant. So David is described here as a servant. Then again, in Psalm 78, verse 72. Which is, which is a very famous verse I use in teaching leadership. He said, it's because that verse says, David served Israel with the integrity of heart. The first point, integrity of heart, spiritual attitude. The first point that we saw, first requirement. And he served them with a serving hand, with a skillful hand, with a skillful hand, he served them. Skillful. Look at the word skill, because, you know, today in the renewal, sometimes we say skills are not important. We are going to come. David was a very skillful musician. Huh? He was not playing all the wrong notes. Very correct notes he was playing. Skillful. David was not only skillful in music. He had skillful hands. He knew how to do a job well. He not only had a heart that wanted to serve, he had hands that were very skillful. Now, I know some of us just say, you know, uh, you know, it's only heart matters, heart matters. You know, if you don't have skills, uh, it's not important. But I believe heart is first thing God looks for. But along with the heart, we also need to add skills to our hands. Take, for example, you know, tomorrow you have to do a surgery. This is a joke I'm cracking here. We, you can have a laughter at it. Tomorrow you are having a surgery to do and there are two types of doctors. One doctor who has a real good heart, very good heart he has and he really wants to, you to get well. 
but you have a doubt whether his hands are skillful, whether he can do a surgery well. Second is a doctor who may be a little wicked at heart. He may extract a little more money from you, but has got very skillful hands. Skillful hands. He does this surgery well. I know immediately whom you will choose. You will go for skillful hands. <laughs> Isn't it? We immediately go for skillful hands. So that's what we find David doing. God doing. So the second point, God leadership is all about service. And service requires a good heart, a right heart. Service also requires skillful hands. And so the second kind of a requirement in order to be selected by God, in order for God to be God to anoint us, if God has to anoint us, first requirement is the spiritual attitude, the matter of the heart. Second requirement is we need to have a servant heart. And when did David become servant? Now that's the question. He never became a servant by joining ministry. In fact, he was doing no ministry by that time. Remember the work of taking care of the sheep. Taking care of the sheep was done usually by the servant of the house. And David was taking care of the sheep. when Samuel came. And so that work is done by the servant of the house. And so perhaps Jesse, you know, if you look at David's family, they were not that well to do off. They were not that financially uh, so rich that they could perhaps afford a servant. How do we know that? The gift in the first session we saw when David is going to meet Saul and the gift that uh, David's father Jesse sends with David to Saul was sent by people who are living middle class lives. So David's family had the sheep, the property in those days was all animals, sheep, but they never could afford a servant to take care of the sheep. And since they couldn't afford a servant to take care of the sheep, someone had to step in. Someone had to step in to take the servant's role in the family. And that is where David steps in to take the servant's role in the family. He learned to become a servant in his family. And that was the quality God was looking for. He was already a servant because he was taking care of the sheep. In fact, when Samuel came to anoint, David was not there. He was taking care of the sheep. And so God selects the one who is a servant. And where is David to become a servant? In the family. Now I'll tell you this is one of the toughest places for us to serve is our family. Ah, it's very easy to go and serve in the church. Huh? Because as soon as you serve them, we hear the song, How Great Thou Art. The story is not there like that in that family life. In fact, in family, you know, even if you serve, no one will thank you. They will say things like, oh, it's your duty. So what, what great about it? You're supposed to do that. That's why you got married. You're supposed to earn. You're married. You are the man of the house. And that is your duty. You are the wife. And the taking care of the house is your duty. It's a very ungrateful job. But that's where God actually is looking for. Today in the renewal, we often talk about, yes, I want to be a servant. God, show me where, where to serve you. And God initially says, you know, I want you to be like David, you know, take up the servant's role in your house. I have a friend of mine who has a very interesting story. Uh, he's also another one who's been used very well by the Lord. You know, I'm amazed at how sometimes... Sometimes we have preached along together in programs and how the Lord uses him. But he shares a very interesting story. 
he says you know victor i'm so busy sometimes uh, doing sessions i need time to prepare and so uh, i would often look out whether we will get a servant in the house and we tried so many things you know we tried uh, so many people ke so many uh, housemaids came and they started the work in the house for some mysterious reason they couldn't uh, survive there for more than a month more than one month no one they will leave and go till one day i was praying about it and i sensed it in my heart god wants me to take that role so he says now most of the work of the house my wife still goes to work i have taken voluntary retirement so most of the work of the house like sobbing the floor washing the vessels and all the household duties i do as soon as i heard that i could remember about david and i realize no wonder the anointing of the lord is upon this brother's life the secret of that anointing he had taken the role of a servant right in the house right in the family i don't know i i, I i can sense brothers and sisters right now many of us are you know uh, contrary to our understanding servant servant is all our, it's all about you know how much uh, we are serving the lord in the church and how many meetings we are having and how many things we are doing all this has all this is good huh? we should be doing it but while doing this if we are neglecting our family life we are not doing god's way you are not doing god's will you are doing god's work but you are not doing god's will and we are called to deal do the will of god not all those who say lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father so david the secret the second secret of david requirement of our anointing number one a spiritual attitude second he was a servant of the house that's where god when he elects he elects the one who has already become a servant in the house let's look at the third requirement okay we are at the second hour only the third requirement first requirement god looks for a spiritual attitude second requirement god looks for a servant the one who is a servant third requirement god is not looking for a public person public person who is very popular in public but he is looking for private person what do i mean by not a public person but a private person public person is very who one who is very popular among people private person is the one who is very popular in his family private no one is watching no one is seeing and the person is living a life pleasing to god when no one is watching when no one is seeing him when samuel came to anoint david okay when samuel came to anoint david david was found taking care of the sheep in private you see taking care of the sheep of the family of the family so it was a private job no one knew no one knew david is doing all this and you know he is doing the hard work no one knew that so he was a private person in work number 1 he was a private work person in work whatever work he did it was unseen it was unknown surely you know whenever we do things so you know how much we are doing in the family no one knows god sees no one knows god knows no one sees remember god is seeing that i want you to get this you know david was not doing any ministry when god anointed him the only place where all this was happening because you know many of us we think you know anointing comes by singing more love more power come holy spirit it's completely contrary to what the scripture talks <clears throat> here it's all about you know how you are living out your vocation 
also david was found uh, you know his work was private number one the work that he did uh, no one knew no one admired and it can happen the same thing can happen to us you know how much we are doing for our family what all we are doing for it no one knows god knows no one is seeing it the family sees it but take, take it for granted you know it's your duty now uh, what big you are doing this and we sometimes feel you know no one is seeing this god is seeing it and here we need to tackle one problem remember all of us deep down within our hearts including myself we have a psychological problem the problem is called i want to be known i want to be seen this was the problem the pharisees had the scribes and the pharisees had when jesus described them in matthew chapter 6 jesus said if they fast in order to be seen they pray in order to be seen they give alms in order to be seen they were public people but rejected by the lord god will never look for a public person he looks for a private person i want you to right now reflect on are you like david do you have any responsibility in the house with your family or are you one person who says you know the family work my wife and my kids have to do i am called to do ministry i want you today to change your track you are not on the right track brother and sister if you are doing that you won't stay long in ministry and you won't go further in your ministry because the anointing the expansion of the anointing happens how you are living out your vocation then before david became you know david became king started his kingship started by having victory over goliath but before he could you know win the victory over goliath which was public which was public we find david was a private person he handled problems in his private life david handled problem in his private life well now what was the problem david faced in his private life what was his private life serving the family now please let me define his private life serving the family by taking care of his father's sheep now while taking care of his father's sheep he faced problems you know all of us who are working will understand this whether we are working in the family or whether we are doing a job problems are a part what were david's problem he describes those problems while doing his uh, daily work serving the family in 1 samuel chapter 17 was 33 we find david describes the problems he says when i was taking care of my father's sheep sometimes the sheep were attacked by lion and bear lion and bear came and attacked my sheep and what i did as they attacked my sheep i fought them and i defeated them david handled problems in his private life well that's the secret of conquering goliaths the secret of conquering goliath is your private life as you are serving in the family as you are doing your daily job and the problems you face there as you are raising up the kids and the problems you face while raising up your kids uh, come on you know i you need to look at how you are dealing with those problems someone falls sick in the family and you have a problem there you know how do how do you how well you take care of that problem david handled he was a private person his work was private and he fought the lion you know fighting the lion and bear two ferocious animals two ferocious animals fighting them 
and gaining victory over them. Ah, you should be very famous. But no one knew it. Now David is telling that. No one knew it. But David is telling Saul now because Saul is not ready to believe in him that he can go and fight Goliath. Before that, no one knew how David is solving problems in his private life. God knew. God observed. And God says, you know, this guy handles problems in his daily life so well. My work also has got problem. He's also doing his work so well. And I've got a work and my work is also full of problems. And God's work is also full of problems. Opposition, criticism, persecution. Who told you, you know, if you do God's work, there are no problems in God's work. You will have other types of problems with God's work. That ministry is all, you know, going on well. When you have the anointing, everything goes well. So God is watching David, how he's doing his private work. Because God says, I've got to work for him. But first, I need to watch out how he's doing the work I've given him at his home. How he's handling his family responsibilities. And how he's handling the problems that are coming in those responsibilities. You see, the anointing is all related with our daily life. Not more power, more you know, more of you in my life singing those songs. It's all about your daily life. I hope so. Today, this session really inspires us to live our daily life well. We start seeing our work and our family life in a different perspective. So we looked at two hours up till now. Number one, we looked at the responsibility for God's anointing, the responsibility for anointing was God's. The requirement for anointing was God's and there were three requirements. God looks at the spiritual attitude. God looks with a man who has a servant's heart and a servant's hand willing to serve and David was serving his family. And God looks for a private person, not a public person. How you are living your private life, your work in the home, your responsibilities at home. That's what David was living his private life. Home, home. And how he's handling the problems that comes in those responsibilities. Remember today all the family responsibilities and all the problems you face is actually preparing for a big ministry. But if you are not able to handle that, come on, you can't handle your family. What will you handle God's family? Today, I want you, brothers and sisters, to have a look at that, how good you are in that. The third R. Let's look at the third R. Something very important. So, the responsibility for anointing was God's. First R. The second R. The requirement for anointing was God's. And we saw look at the three requirements. Third, the response to anointing. The response to anointing is God's. Now, what do I mean by response to anointing? Okay. Basically, it means... God decides that he anoints you now. That's what happened to David. But he's going to use you quite later in life. I repeat again. God is going to anoint you now. But you are going to be used later in life. That's what happened to David. He was anointed by Samuel. And he was 17 years old when he was anointed. And why you Samuel anointed him? As the next king of Israel. As the next king of Israel, he was anointed at the age of 17. When did David become the king of Israel? At the age of 30. 13 years of waiting. He never became king immediately after he was anointed. And that was God's response to the anointing. I anoint you now. But what I have anointed you for, the work that I have anointed you for, that work is going to come much later. Now, this is where many of us make a mistake. We go to the retreat and we say, you know, father called out my name and father said, you know, God has a great plan for you. God is going to use you. And what do we do? After as soon as we come for the retreat, we jump into the ministry. We immediately start the ministry. 
I have a calling. Yes, you have a calling. God told you what? The only thing is he has not told you when. And you are deciding that when. Which can be a mistake. And so it took 13 years after David was anointed by Samuel. He could have easily said, you know, oh, I am the next king. And he says, where is the crown? Come on, come and give me the crown. No, he waited. Remember, God had anointed him. Now, this is a lesson we have to learn. But it took 13 years for David to win the trust of people, to win the trust of people where they come in 1 Samuel chapter 5 and they say, David, now we want you to be the king of Israel. 13 years for David to win the trust of the people of Israel. So what did David, now as we are ending, <laughs> what do you do in those 13 years of waiting? <laughs> Very important. What do you do in those 13 years of waiting? Where There is one uh, similarity I have with David's life. This, uh, the similarity is this. And that's why I love this character. David was anointed by the Lord when he was 17. I was touched at the charismatic retreat uh, when I was 17. David became the king of Israel at the age of 30. Now, I don't want to say I'm equal to David, but I'm just saying this were some similarities. Uh, my full-time ministry started when I was 30 years old. The whole aspect was what did David do in those 13 years of waiting. Let's look at uh, two things that happened to David in those 13 years. And this is, we are coming to the conclusion. Two things. Number one, after David was anointed as king, remember, he could have, and Samuel, uh, if after Samuel left, he could have told his family because his family was treating him like a servant. You saw Samuel came and anointed me, which means now all of you all know who am I. I am the next king of Israel. So you all better find someone to take care of the sheep. Okay. I am going to practice. I am going to start practicing how a king of Israel lives. And you all better now respect me. David does none of those things. You know where does David go after that? Goes back to his sheep. The same job. The anointing has not gone in his head. Huh? And I am chosen by the Lord. I am anointed by the Lord. So humble. Back. After Samuel has anointed him, David is back. Taking care of the sheep. Same job. Now, this is all for all of us who feel, you know, God has a great plan for you. You've gone for to a retreat center and your name is called out. And a word has come about you that, you know, God is going to use you powerfully. God has got a mighty plan for you. Hello, brother, sister. Just hold on. Don't come home and start blowing the trumpet. This is what the Lord told me and I'm going to start now. Get back to your daily life. Let God open the doors and let God fulfill the word. David goes back to his sheep. The next thing that happens to David is he has a trouble for 12, those 13 years. We know after he kills Goliath, he becomes very famous. We are going to look at that whole chapter brokenness, how, how God David is going through a time of brokenness where he's breaking. The next thing that David is going through is suffering. Time of suffering in those 13 years. Persecuted by Saul. And he's running away from Saul. And God is watching out. Remember, God's work also has problems. God is watching out 
that as david is suffering in his personal life whether he is going to run away from me whether he is going to leave me or whether he is going to stick with me and david is faithful to god in those 12 years of suffering where saul is persecuting him this were the two things that happened in david's life service and suffering service where what he was doing he kept on doing that taking care of his father's sheep same things nothing new happened after the anointing nothing new new ministry started a new thing started nothing new same thing same service same job because some of us after we feel we are anointed we look for something now what god is going to do through me how god is going to use me no no it's the same thing same thing service and suffering and i believe when god you know the famous verse in the gospel many are called few are chosen what happened to the others in between suffering the word suffering you are called for an interview whether you pass the interview chosen to choose you have to pass the interview you have to pass the test to become the chosen all of us are called god knows how many of us will be chosen the chosen ones are those ones who remain faithful to god in their time of suffering and david hung on to god in that time because he knew god is doing his work at a time when we are not aware how god is working my daily work i am doing david is doing his daily work of taking care of his father's sheep and going through suffering for many of us that is not the method that god can use to use me the response to god's anointing the response to anointing is god's god anoints you now but it doesn't mean he will start using you now when god will actually start using you will come perhaps years later later it will come and in the meanwhile in the meantime what do you and i do we continue to serve in our vocation family we remain loyal to the lord as we go through times of suffering like david so as i conclude today we have learned a lot about anointing and which is so contrary to our idea i know when i have talked and spoken to people you know how do you uh, receive the anointing of the lord how do you remain anointed with the lord i get answers like you know we need to spend more time in prayer more fasting more praying no i'm not saying these things are wrong these things are good they are spiritual but the most important thing is how are you living out your vocation and today brothers and sisters this whole week till we come for the next session on david i want you to reflect on is how you are living out your vocation remember vocation presides over ministry it presides over your ministry because vocation is a way of life it's a way of life that god has chosen you to live ministry is what you will do in life but the way of life comes first how you want to live i want you to really have a look at your family responsibilities are you really doing it well like david he really took care even next time when we will see when david is going to fight goliath you know he is not going to fight goliath he is actually going to meet his brothers who are there in the battlefield and is taking a tiffin box to them but when he is going there look at him he is also concerned who will take care of my sheep he is not neglecting his sheep oh now let it be i have to go there and do that work and so he is neglecting his sheep david is not neglecting his sheep 
David says, David kept the sheep with the keeper. Look at his what responsibility. He was very good at his daily responsibilities. Are you good at your daily responsibilities? Because that is where God looks at. That's the requirement for anointing. God may have called you, brothers and sisters, many years ago, you have heard a word from the Lord that I have called you and I have chosen you to do my work. And now years are passing by and you are wondering whether you will be. I want you to focus on, because God is focusing on this. Uh, how are you serving the Lord right now in your vocation? Not only how you are serving the Lord in your vocation, how you are doing in your suffering? Are you loyal to him? Let's today pray for the grace. Anointing is all about how I live out my vocation. Let's pray that we may too have the grace like David. Okay? He was a private person, not a public person. He was a servant. He had a heart for the Lord. And all these things happened before he could actually enter into doing ministry for God. All these things happened when David was serving in his family. When he took the servant role because his family couldn't afford a servant. And he takes on the servant role to serve the family. <laughs> family life, folks. Family life. That's the secret to the anointing. Let's bow our heads and pray. I also today our minds are blown off. Contrary, you know, more love, more power, more of you in my life. God says, yeah, more of me. Yeah, first you start giving more of you. Always you are asking more of you. Now you start giving more of you. Let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Lord for the grace that we live out our vocation where I know this has been a secret of my life. I always focus on my vocation. Always try to focus on how I'm living it well. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for the life of David. And today, Lord, we want to praise you and thank you for what we have learned from his life. This whole aspect, Lord, of, of anointing and we learned, Lord, three things. That the responsibility of anointing is yours. You are the one who chooses whom to anoint. And today, Lord, you have shown us that you went and anointed David because he was a man after your own heart. And that heart was developed as he took on the role of a servant in his family, taking care of the sheep. We learned, Lord, that the requirement for anointing is yours alone. That you are the one who decides what are the requirements and you look at our hearts. You look at our desire to serve, that we are servant and that desire is already practiced, Lord, in the family. You can see us, how we are having a servant's heart in the family as David was serving his family, taking care of the sheep. And Lord, while taking care of those family responsibilities, we face challenges that David faced, the challenges of lion and bear. And you watch out, how do we handle those challenges? How David depended upon you in his private life. That it became so easy for him to depend upon you in his public life. Lastly, Lord, quite a number of us, we have felt that you have spoken a word and we have been chosen by you. That you have chosen us to serve you. To serve you, we got a message in a retreat that we heard a word from a particular preacher who told us that you have chosen us and we are going to be your powerful instruments. And we thought, Lord, that it will happen immediately. But David's life, Lord, teaches us the response to the anointing is yours. You anoint at one time and you fulfill at another time. May we trust your timings. May we trust your timings. 
may we not get frustrated disappointed discouraged but in the meanwhile like david in those 13 years was serving you in his family was faithful to you in his suffering may we do the same thing may each of us lord have a grace have the grace to be anointed servant of yours may we keep this secret of anointing the secret is lord living out our vocation which is a real difficult calling no one sees it no one knows it only you see it only you know it that's why you decide to anoint give us this grace to live out a vocation well in jesus name we pray amen 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 amen, amen. amen. amen.